Good day and welcome to Letters and Politics. I'm Mitch Chesrich. In 1924, Clifford Walker, the governor of Georgia, told a Ku Klux Klan rally that the United States should, quote, build a wall of steel, as a wall as high as heaven against immigrants. His slogan was keeping America the land for the Americans. Today we're going to be in conversation about the second iteration of the KKK in the 1920s that, unlike its predecessor, just after the Civil War spread throughout the country and could even be found in states like Oregon and California, even where I'm broadcasting from here in the San Francisco Bay Area. My guest for this conversation is Pulitzer Prize winning reporter Timothy Egan. He is the author of the book where I grabbed that quote from called A Fever in the Heartland, The Ku Klux Klan's Plot to Take Over America and the Woman who stopped them. Timothy Egan, it is my very good pleasure to welcome you to this program. Well, thank you. I'm pleased to be with you. One, one, let me quote your book one last time here. You write this, quote, In the golden age of fraternal organizations, the Klan was the largest and most powerful of the secret societies among American men, bigger by far than the Odd Fellows, the Elks, or the Freemasons, and vastly greater in number than the original Klan born in violence just after the Civil War. Um, it is fascinating to think that this, I guess we call it the second iteration, some people call it the second coming of the Ku Klux Klan in the, in the 1920s, was much bigger than what we normally associate with the Ku Klux Klan right after the Civil War. Yeah, it, to me it was fascinating, and it's a largely unknown you know, epoch in our history because we do think of the Klan as that just after the Civil War, they're, they're born in just pure violence and terror, and then we think of them in the 60s where there was a reaction to the civil rights movement. But in fact, they were at their apex, uh, not just of terror, but of political power in the 1920s. Now, I'll just give you a couple of numbers here that, that astonished me. There were up to 6 million Americans who put their hand on a Bible and swore to, quote, forever uphold white supremacy, which was the Klan oath. <clears throat> there were at least three governors elected as open Klansmen. The governor of Oregon, the governor of Colorado, the governor of Indiana, all northern states, of course, not part of the Confederacy. And the governor of Colorado, Clarence Morley, when he, after he was elected in 1924, you know what his slogan was? Every man under the Capitol Dome, a Klansman. So uh, they were both politically powerful and powerful in numbers. And on the surface, they looked like kind of Main Street, Norman Rockwellian, a lot of small town, you know, uh, mom and pop clan. But of course, you know, you put your hand on that Bible and for and swore to forever pulled white supremacy because you had a dark heart and violence was still part of their toolkit. Is there a connection? I mean, obviously the name and obviously the racism, but is there actually a, a, a connection between the first clan during sort of reconstruction and, and the end of the Civil War, or maybe the end of the Civil War, and this clan? Is there a is, is there a continuation at all, or are these two separate? Uh, well, yeah, I would say an expansion of the brand. And here's what happened: the first clan was basically run out of existence by a very courageous general, Ulysses Grant, who declared martial law and sent federal troops down there and broke them. They broke them. By 1872, they were they had disbanded, burned their membership guards. 5,000 of them were in jail. That was a terror group. So they disappeared for almost 50 years. Now, what gives them flight is a movie, The Birth of a Nation, mm. which was the most popular movie of the early 20th century. One in four Americans saw that film. One in four, especially in the North. And that film was a huge piece of racial propaganda, basically portraying the Klan as heroic in the post-Civil War era. And Northerners were all carpetbaggers, Blacks were all subhuman. And you know, the people who rode to the rescue in that film was the Ku Klux Klan. So, you know, millions of Amer 25 million Americans saw that film. And they came out of it, and they, when they walked out of the theater, they walked right into the hands of Klan recruiters. So yeah, it, it was it, it was the same clan in the sense that they had the name, but here's what was different. They vastly expanded their hatreds. The original clan was born in animus to the fact that 30, excuse me, um, uh, 4 million people had been enslaved and were now citizens. 36% of the American South was that had African American citizens. And that was the clan's reaction to them, was to form hatred and terror. <clears throat> the 20s clan, vastly expanded that they hated jews why because we let two million jews came to this country in the first part of the 20th century fleeing places like ukraine and russia and uh poland and parts of germany there were all these pogroms and so we had a huge insurgency of 
of Jewish people coming to our country. African Americans were moving north in the Great Migration. There was a reaction to that in places like Oregon and Indiana. And finally, you know, social liberation of women. So they'd been given the vote in 1920, and then they weren't just given the vote, but during Prohibition, they really cut loose. They declared themselves independent of men. They went to these speakeasies and danced, and, you know, they were called flappers, and uh, the Klan despised that because it was a threat to hearth and home. So their range of hatreds in the 20s was hugely opened up to all the perceived fear of others. Um, and that's what made them so powerful is because, and I think that's why they took root in the North because of all this churn going on in America a hundred years ago. It is interesting because you, we usually think of the 1920s as, as the roaring 20s. Yeah. Yeah. And it was roaring. Uh, it was Great Gatsby. It was, you know, uh, <laughs> the greatest social experiment uh, probably in our history was prohibition trying to outlaw alcohol in every square foot of the United States. Well, that backfired dramatically and produced all these underground clubs. Mm -hmm. The greatest cultural gift that African-Americans gave the world was jazz. And jazz took off during the jazz age. And those two things, drinking and jazz, were the, you know, just, uh, the, the, the Klan just they all perceived it as this huge threat to home and hearth American. Now, you quoted this uh, America for Americans. That, that they would have stickers that said, 100%, we sell to only 100% Americans. Now, who was a 100% American? It's not in our Constitution, but their view was one race and one religion. So they hated Catholics as well. I didn't mention that. Um, 800,000 Sicilians came to our country in the first 20 years after it had been a terrible earthquake in Sicily. And, and they were darker skinned than the earlier immigrants. They spoke a dialect of Italian. They had big Catholic families. That was a huge threat to the Klan, and they used that to recruit as well. Do you think this whole idea of the Roaring Twenties, there's always this element of when times are good, they're, they're, they're not good for everyone, or, or some inevitably end up feeling insecure. Do you think that's an element of what's Yeah, that? I mean, that's a good point. Um, I'll, I'll tell you, they weren't good for all the Americans who were on the enemies list of the Ku Klux Klan, which was, you know, a lot of Americans. Their enemies list included, you know, an excess of probably 25 million Americans who made up that list of Catholics, Jews, blacks, and immigrants. Um, and here's what happened is, you know, we had redlining in the North. Jim Crow moved North. So they tried to keep, we had laws making it a felony, in some states, for people to marry another person, a person of another race. Um, they had these eugenics laws, which was a huge part of the Ku Klux Klan's platform in the 1920s. They passed eugenics laws in 30 American states that, uh, allowed them to involuntarily sterilize undesirables. Now, who was an undesirable? Well, someone who had epilepsy, or someone who was an alcoholic, or a so-called promiscuous woman, or gay. I mean, there was a whole list of people who could be involuntarily sterilized under the Klan program. So, I mean, it, yeah, the, the, the sad part of, of my story, I mean, my story is about one woman who ultimately brings this monster, this grand dragon of the North, who the guy who controls 21 states and he wants to be president he wants to be you know the and he, and he gets pretty close to obtaining all his power but the sad part is by the time this one woman finally brings him down the clan has achieved most of its goals they pass an immigration act in 1924 that makes it almost impossible for jews to come to this country let alone asians or people from africa or people from southern europe greeks and, and southern italians um, they have their eugenics laws in all these states. They've got prohibition, which is, you know, which is what they wanted, outlawing alcohol everywhere. So they've got, and they've got Jim Crow in the North. So they've got most of their goals achieved by the time the great conflict of this book happens. And, and that grand wizard is D.C. Stevenson, and we're going to talk about him, and as well as the woman Madge Oberholzer. Um, that's really what your book focuses on. A question, though, when you were laying all that out about the 1920s and the Ku Klux Klan, what, what, wasn't D.C. Stevenson paying attention to Europe and the rise of fascism, particularly in, in Italy? Yeah, that's. <clears throat> it's, I'm glad you brought that up. It's one of the interesting ironies here. Italians were the enemy were one of the enemies of the clan because immigrants okay but he loved mussolini his his role model i wouldn't say he loved him but his role model was mussolini so the grand dragon of the 
American Midwest, the most powerful Klansman ever to stride the earth, a guy who once attracted 200,000 people to a rally, 200,000 in the cornfields of Kokomo, uh, Indiana, uh, study the speeches of Mussolini. Uh, he was a kind of a drifter, a con man, a liar, um, a serial sex assault person who, um, like a lot of American archetypes of that guy, <laughs> said things that people wanted to hear, uh, knew how to manipulate fear. And, you know, using all that sort of combination, he rose from, from nothing, literally just a drifter, rolls into southern Indiana in 1921 in four f short years to being so powerful that he said, I am the law. And, and most people felt that he was the law. It's interesting. And I think we should also mention that in Congress, there were several uh, avowed Klan members, number of senators and, and representatives. Well, isn't that amazing? Because right now, if you go to a microphone and call a press conference and you say, I am a proud member of the Ku Klux Klan, you're hissed, booed, shamed, trolled. In 1924, a little more than 100 years ago, a little less than 100 years ago, if you went to a microphone and said, I am a proud Klansman, you could be a United States senator yeah. uh, or a governor. They controlled, by their own estimate, about 75 members of Congress. They had an office in D.C., with a staff of 60 that was less than a mile. It was like a, a lobby. They had a march in the summer of 1925, right down the heart of the Capitol that went from the Capitol building to the Treasury building in broad daylight. They weren't hiding. And 50,000 Klansmen marched in that march. So yeah, they had a pretty good stranglehold. Also, I should add this. The 1924 political conventions um, the Klan had such a stranglehold on both parties, Democrats, because they're mainly from the South, Republicans based in the Midwest, that Time magazine put the Imperial Wizard on the cover and wrote a largely praiseworthy story about how influential and powerful this fraternal order of hate was in 1924. I, I am coming to you from the San Francisco Bay Area, Oakland specifically. I, I was shocked the first time I saw photos of a Klan rally at the Oakland Auditorium, which I basically live next door to. Uh, there are photos of a Klan rally in Tilden Park in Berkeley. Uh, there are photos of a Klan rally in Richmond uh, on the streets, a, a march. Uh, you began your search, Timothy Egan, uh, in Oregon, but it led you to Indiana. What's important to know about Indiana? Well, let me just say about Oregon for one second. You know, we think of it as this woke, uber woke state, but in fact, a hundred years ago, uh, it was it was you know they had led they were the first state to elect a, an open claim sympathetic governor, Walter Pierce, also to pass by a vote of the people a law that essentially outlawed Catholic schools, which was aimed strictly at immigrants, Irish and Italian. Um, they had a rally at Astoria, the first American town west of the Rocky Mountains, that attracted ten thousand people. <clears throat> California. Anaheim was so Klan infested with the Klan majority city council that its nickname was Klanaheim. So, you know, it was, it, it was up and down the West Coast. And that's, I was going to start my story, build my book, I'm a Pacific Northwesterner around Oregon. But the story took me to Indiana for this reason. My God, it was the absolute epicenter, epicenter of Klan power 100 years ago. One in three white males, more than 300,000 men, wore the Klan hood in its robes. One in three white males. They had a Klan governor. They had a Klan majority state legislature. A majority of their members of Congress owed their allegiance to the Klan. Um, it was, they called it a Klan Republic. And their nickname for the town, the main town, Indianapolis, was Klanopolis. So at the height of their power, they owned, they, they owned the state. And this, this state was owned by this grand dragon named D.C. Stevenson. So that's why my story took me there, because, you know, we think of it as this quintessential American town, uh, subject of our musicals, and, you know, that it's geographically and in many other ways the, the epicenter of Americana. And, and that's what so intrigued me is about the story, was that, again, on the surface, it looks so Norman Rockwellian. I mean, they had a Ku Klux Kitties brigade. You know, little children, eight, nine, and ten years old, going into dens and putting on these hoods and being taught who to hate, and then parading. There's pictures in the book of the Ku Klux Kitties. That a women's auxiliary that attracted more than two million women, many of them suffragettes, by the way, um, mm. who they wanted equal rights for white supremacists, is what they said. So um, 
uh, Indiana on the surface just looks so, again, Rockwellian, so mainstream. But it's what was below that surface that was so dark and awful. This iteration of the Klan, I mean, they meant to portray themselves as, as, as respectable, unlike yeah. the previous Klan. They were the people who held their communities together. The previous Klan was a terror group. The 1960s Klan was open criminals. The, the 1920s Klan were a bunch of merchants, bankers, politicians, prosecutors, judges, teachers, and preachers. They bribed an awful lot of Protestant ministers to preach the word of hate along with the word of God. And that was, that was really, you mentioned at the top of this conversation, the fraternal orders. The way this guy, D.C. Stevenson, was able to take over the Midwest was twofold. Uh, he infiltrated the fraternal orders, you know, took some of their silly rituals, the secret handshake, the gibberish, the clubby stuff, the, you know, the fact that you, you were all one in one society, and applied them directly to the clan. And also recruited from these orders because they were men already. And number two, the churches. He went from town to town recruiting a key evangelical minister. And before long, he had half the congregation joining as well. And all of that was driven by this fear of others. You know, the, the changing America, these immigrants who weren't Christian, these blacks moving north, these women acting audaciously. How dare they go out at night without their husband? All that was, you know, reacting to the change. This is Letters and Politics, and we are in conversation with Pulitzer Prize winning reporter Timothy Egan. He joins us for a conversation about his book called A Fever in the Heartland, The Ku Klux Klan's Plot to Take Over America and the Woman Who Stopped Them. D.C. Stevenson, again, the, the Grand Wizard of the KKK in, in Indiana. Grand Dragon, actually. Grand, Dra yeah. Grand Dragon. Yeah. So yeah. there's a difference. Right, right. Well, the Imperial Wizard is the head guy. He was on the cover of Time Magazine. The Grand Dragon is the, the regional head, so he was the head of the of the realm of Indiana, and his, he also had 21 states under his control. How did he rise to this position? Uh, lies, charm, saying things that people wanted to hear, fear, um, and he also, but Napoleon was another role model. He had people who feared him. So he had a morality patrol. This is another fascinating thing. It's kind of like the Taliban light. 30,000 men who were legally deputized. They had their little badge. They weren't cops, but they had a little badge to go out and harass, harass enemies of clan certified virtue. So what did they do? <clears throat> they broke up speakeasies. They went out with flashlights and guns to find parked cars because there were lovers embracing in those parked cars. And they broke those up. They smashed, you know, booze wherever they found it. They um, would go out on Sunday and close Jewish retailers whose shops had been open on Sunday. So, you know, all of this is against the Constitution, but that didn't stop them from doing this. So he rose by that personal combination of his charm, his magnetism, his charisma, and his stoking of hatred and saying the things that people wanted to hear. But on the other hand, he also had an iron fist. So he had these this squad that went out to enforce all his dictates. And and, and, and he said, what, I, I am the law? You know, he openly bragged that. By 1924, he was in such complete control. And he was starting to act monstrously. He was starting to become more of a of just an open violent criminal he was sexually assaulting women he raped several women and he got away with it now here's a guy who's preaching temperance who was a raging alcoholic here's a guy who's preaching purity of women who was raping women here's a guy who's preaching prohibition who was a bootlegger uh, here's a guy who's preaching christian values of truth who lied 12 days 12 ways before sunday he was everything I guess what he said he was. But um, when he said, I am the law, that was really the height of his hubris. He thought nothing could touch me because a bunch of institutions had taken big swings at him, including the NAACP. We should give them credit for breaking with the Republican Party after Calvin Coolidge, President Calvin Coolidge, refused to denounce the Klan in Indiana. But they failed to bring Stevenson down. Notre Dame, after rioting, the, student, the Catholic students rioting against the Klansmen, giving rise to their name of their team still, the Fighting Irish, they failed. 
it, it all came down to ultimately, as he's saying, I am the law, to this one lone woman who, you know, was hugely instrumental. Breaking with the Republican, the NAACP breaking with the Republican Party, is this, we usually associate sort of maybe more of the 30s of this shift in, in voting trends. Do you think this is And the reason this, that's, and I'm really glad you pointed that out, that's a good historical nuance. Yes, we saw it for in 1932 with Franklin Roosevelt's election. That was the first time the African American vote went very strongly for a Democrat. But the break happened in the 20s and it happened over the Klan. Um, James Weldon Johnson, a very powerful, fascinating, multi-talented head of the NAACP, went to Indiana and said, you know, we have been the most loyal block of voters since Abraham Lincoln gave African Americans the vote. For 50 years, we have been the best block Republicans have ever had. But if you won't denounce what's happened here in Indiana with the Klan taking over the Republican Party its entirety, we're gone. So they did bolt. Now they parked themselves in the middle for a while. And he, Johnson said, well, well, we'll decide which side we go on, but we're not going to be loyal right now to the party we've always been to. So it started in the 20s. You saw it in the 32 election. The term, I am the law. I mean, it's, it's, sometimes we say it jokingly, hopefully jokingly today, but maybe not everyone. Um, you you yeah. see it in, in the controversial um, Comedy Central cartoon, uh, right. South Park. I am the law. I, I, don't, right. I mean, it's such an easy, <laughs> anybody could say it, right? So I don't, uh, but do you think this is where it becomes popularized? Well, popularized? anybody can say it, but very few people can prove it. Yeah. And this is part of Stevenson's power. I hate to say this, but I came to the conclusion that a man who has no bottom to his shame, is a very powerful man. Most of us will not go there. Most of us, when we cross a point, we have a pang of conscience, okay? But if you will go there, if you have no bottom to your shame, you're a very powerful man. He demonstrated he was the law. Um, in late 1924, he violently attacked a woman in a hotel room when he was drunk and tried to rape her. The cops came. He was briefly in jail for 24 hours. But he used his connections. It was a Klan mayor who was his lawyer, and they hushed the whole thing up, and he never faced any charges. Now, inevitably, although I never mention his name in the book, this gives rise to the resonance of a certain ex-president who famously said, I could walk down Fifth Avenue and shoot somebody, and I would not lose any followers. Now, this is one of the reasons I like history. It's not just because they're good, good stories, and this is an incredible story, but because of what it tells us about today. I mean, the build the wall, which we began with, is right. I mean, this is uh, you know, the, the calls no, for building the wall today are, are are not new. No, nor are the calls for you know make America great. The, back then, it was make America a nation for one hundred percent Americans. They had little stickers in their shops. That was an anti-Semitic thing because it was a way to say, don't trade with Jews, trade with Americans only, meaning Jews weren't Americans. Uh, and I should say, you know, the biggest anti-Semite in the era of the Klan was Henry Ford. Um, you know, and when you bought a Model T in 1924, you got an owner's manual and you also got a vile anti-Semitic track that he included in the purchase of the car. So, I mean... It's important to stress that the Klan wasn't some little fringe group, that they had a lot of mainstream help. I mean, just to, to, to think of it on scale, I mean, this is the, the big thing that's happening in the 20s with Henry Ford. It would almost be like Microsoft today. Exactly. Imagine every time you put, uh, you know, went, new, updated your Windows and your computer, you got a whole, you downloaded a whole track of, of you know, a false, you know, it was the protocol of the elders of Zion, which is a known fraud implying that there's a Jewish conspiracy. But imagine if you got that with, with their main product. You know, he was the celebrated industrialist of his day. He said at one point, he bit into a candy bar, and it didn't taste right to him. He said, the Jews have ruined it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so I mean, it didn't come out of just clan dens. It was very mainstream. Who was Madge Oberholzer? So she's the subtitle of my book. And you know, we write a lot about historical figures. I have as well. You know, for a brief period, I was really into Teddy Roosevelt, writing about the founding of the Forest Service. And I was into Edward Curtis, uh, the photographer of Native Americans. Um, but i am always been interested in people at the ed margins, the people who sort of get written out of the story or never get written into the story. And Madge Oberholzer is one of those people. She was 28 years old, a single woman, a woman of her age, had her hair cut in a short bob, 
kind of a flapper um, and dated several men, uh, didn't feel like she needed a man to complete her. Uh, but her ch job was on the chopping block in 1925. The state was going to get rid of her job. And so she had to go to the one man who could save her job. That is the guy who controlled the state, D.C. Stevenson, Grand Dragon of the Indiana realm, of the largest clan the world had ever seen. And what happened? There was a violent and horrible and monstrous and dark and evil encounter with the man who said, I am the law pretending and showing once again that he was the law but madge's words ultimately in a court of law and you know this is kind of why i was disappointed that we didn't have a an actual trial in the fox versus dominion lawsuit is because when you put the facts in a court of law and you force people to just you know put their hand on a bible and swear swear out in under oath it's a little different than just demagoguing in public well they finally got madge's words in a court of law it was enough to put away this monster, D.C. Stevenson. So that's why I give her credit. Without telling you what happens in the story, I could tell you that the revelations that she brought to this, it was a trial of the century, right? The Scopes Monkey trial had happened the same year. But in Indiana, it was the trial of the century. And all the major papers covered. And the revelations showed that this guy who was professing so much virtue was an absolute monster. And it, the Klan cratered after that. Their membership went from... 6 million people to just under 100,000 within a year or two of Madge Oberholzer's revelations. So Madge Oberholzer was kidnapped by D.C. Stevenson, raped, and eventually she would die from her injuries. D.V. Stevenson would be put on trial, be found guilty, and would go to jail for many years. What did this mean for the Klan? So they never really recovered because there were some similar scandals. Uh, the Grand Dragon in, in um, Colorado, which remember I said they had elected a Klan governor, uh, was accused of um, pedophilia, an attack on a boy. The Grand Dragon in um, Oregon was accused of killing a woman. So these kind of scandals happened across the country and they showed just who these people really were. Uh, they were horrible people. And these horrible people were leading a mass of so-called good Americans um, to profess to be 100% Americans. So the Klan never recovered. And by the 1930s, they were bankrupt. So bankrupt that their grand imperial palace in Atlanta, where they got their second start, was sold to the Catholic Church, one of their, one of their enemies, by the way. Uh, and so powerful, so powerless, I should say, that then in that same 1930s, they had to declare bankruptcy. They were no more. They've never come close to what they were since then. If he was the law, then why didn't he get off this time? Well, um, it was a Klan sympathetic jury in the small town. But I think this brilliant prosecutor, a guy named Will Remy, whose life was threatened repeatedly by the Klan and who was the only major public elected official who was not um, loyal to D.C. Stevenson, who brought him to trial, was absolutely brilliant in the way he prosecuted this thing. He made it a thing about your daughter, your wife, um, someone, a woman you love. And also the women in the courtroom were very powerful. They'd formed a sort of chorus of, of outrage against D.C. Stevenson. So the prosecutor made it, you know, they made it kind of every day, like, this guy could do what he did to Madge to your daughter. So he personalized it. He took it. He knew he, he wanted to bring down the Klan, but he knew if he made it about the Klan, he couldn't bring them down. So the way he brought them down was made it personal, about your daughter, your wife, the sexual assault, that sort of thing. Well, why do you think this wasn't just sort of an isolated case? This guy was bad. Why, why did it have such a major impact on the rest of the Klan? Because he was the most powerful member of the Klan, and he was the face of the Klan. He, remember, he, his role model was Napoleon and his other role model was Mussolini. He, he was well known. Mm -hmm. Look, he would have gotten their vacant United States Senate seat because the governor he, was in his pocket. He was a Klan governor. And in 1928, he planned to run for president. Now, he did serve at least 30 years in prison. And in one of the prison interviews, the prosecutor who put him away actually interviewed him years later in prison and asked him. And he said, uh, you know, do you think you really would have won the presidency in 1928. He said, well, I yeah, I do think I would have won. 
but you wouldn't have really called it, you wouldn't have considered it the presidency the way we consider it. He goes, oh, why is that? He goes, it would have been a dictatorship. So, I mean, you know, you can laugh about it, but we had a really close call. American democracy did in the 1920s. And one of the things that this book changed, one of the ways that this book changed me was I used to think that our democracy was pretty stable. And it's not. It's a fragile thing. Uh, it was nearly broken in the 1920s. It was nearly broken in the 2020s. Did he regret his previous actions? As, as he he compared himself to Jesus Christ as a martyr. He filed uh, more than 300 different appeals. All of them were rejected. Uh, he served nearly 30 years in jail. And at the age of 71, when he finally got out, one of the first things he did was attempt to sexually molest a 16-year-old girl. He was incorrigible. What happened to him after that? Did he, did he get arrested again? He sort of, you know, they they thought he was too old. I mean, this is how we've changed our view. of men. He was 71. They thought he was too old to go back to prison. So they let him off saying, you know, this this event happened in Missouri. And they the condition was he never set foot in the state of Missouri again. Uh, they would they would let you know not put him back in jail, and then he you know remarries again while he still had multiple marriages left behind. Never regretted it. Never apologized. Uh, lied to the very end. Said he was a war hero. World War One. Um, you know, was just a psychopath. It's interesting in thinking about Mussolini. I just learned recently because I had never been to Italy that. Italy sees its fascist past differently than, say, Germany does. Um, that Mussolini's home is still even a place that people go on pilgrimage uh, to, to visit in northern Italy. Uh, how do people today in Indiana see D.C. Stevenson? Is, is he somebody who's remembered? You know, that's a great question. Um, they've tried to erase him. I think they're pretty embarrassed that they turned their entire state over to a grand dragon. So you could find this story and it's been told by some academics and there was even a, a television movie about this 30 years ago. The story is known. I spent a lot of time in the archives of the Indiana Historical Society of Ball State University and, and it's there. And you can't open a newspaper from the 1920s without these big block banner headlines about D.C. Stevenson and the Ku Klux Klan. It was huge. And all the histories written at the time said, God, how did we turn our entire state over to the Ku Klux Klan? But now they don't teach this. It's forgotten. And I, since my book's been out barely a month, I've gotten an awful lot of notes from people in Indiana saying, I sort of knew something about this, but I didn't know hardly anything. So they do not, they, you know, look, this is one thing that bothers me about our view of history is we practice too much am willful amnesia. You know, that these things we want to protect. And I'm not afraid of the bad parts of our history. I think it makes us stronger to understand the bad parts of our history. But but in Indiana, they've largely chosen to forget this. And, I'm you know, I'm still waiting for my invitation from Mike Pence to come speak in his hometown. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding about that, of course. Any, any significance <laughs> about Mike Pence's hometown? No, I mean, I mean, they had a clan, as everyone did, because, okay, there are 92 counties in the state of Indiana, all but two of them. <laughs> All but two of them had a Klan den. And, and again, it's not just a Indiana who is burying this history. I mean, again, we had a Klan here in the 1920s the West in the Coast, San Francisco yeah. Bay Area. Most people don't realize that. Most people, I, I suspect, I mean, maybe I'm not representative of most people, but I think other, most, many other people were also shocked the first time they see those photos. And, you know, um, I live in the Northwest in Seattle, and um, I started uh, launched my book here in Seattle, and I told a gasping crowd that just outside Seattle in 1924, there was a rally, a cross burning of 17,000 hooded Klansmen in, you know, the liberal Seattle area. Yeah, it, it, you know, when the Grand Dragon toured, when the Imperial Wizard toured the West Coast in the 1920s, Chamber of Commerce feted him. Um, you know, it's heroes welcome up and down the West Coast. So we are certainly, it, it, you know, when you write a story like this, you think, oh, well, it's all those people in Indiana. No, I mean, 
Uh, the West Coast had just as much Klan activity. A lot of it actually in the Bay Area was initially directed at Asians too. That was that was first. They sort of tailored their hate to the region. Uh, so for a while, the Klan threatened you know farmers who would hire Asians because they didn't want Asians to have, to own farms in the Bay Area. Uh, they threatened them. That was their big part of their campaign. The trial of D.C. Stevenson over Madge Oberholzer obviously is is an important mark in bringing down this iteration of the Klan, but it's not the only opposition to the Klan at this time. Yeah, I was heartened by some real heroes. Uh, who's your heroes? That were there was a, hand, a couple of rabbis, including one five foot two inch brave rabbi who showed up at a Klan rally at night at a cemetery where they're all wearing their hoods and burning these crosses. And he told them they were a bunch of gutless cowards to their face and walked away. Um, the NAACP, ACP, as I said several times, boycotted them, staged big rallies uh, you know, against you know, the cops said they would arrest them if they staged the rallies. Irish Americans allied with blacks and Jews started a newspaper called Tolerance. And what they did is once a week, they would print a list of all the members of the Ku Klux Klan in their community. They had guys on the inside giving them these lists. Now, why would that be important? Because the Klan was also known as the Invisible Empire. And their idea was, we'll unmask them. We'll tell who they are. But you know what happened? It backfired. Instead of being shameful, it was validating. So people would look at that list and go, oh, wow, there's, a, there's my banker. There's my neighbor. There's my minister. I, I better join. So, yeah, there was, there was opposition, plenty of opposition. But it, Is that how it became a, a sign of pride or a, a, a badge of pride? Is, is that their name? At first it was more secretive, and then the names yeah, were published, and, and now and they, that it was out there, they embraced and, it? They did. And, you know, even at their peak, they wrote, you know, handbooks and tracts, which I read, that said our, our anonymity, our invisibleness is what gives us power. So they, they embraced being <clears throat> the invisible empire. And when they had those 200,000 people show up on 4th of July on the cornfields of Kokomo, for the first part of the rally, though the sun was beating down on them, they all had their hoods on. And if you were a reporter covering that rally, you had to write out a, a sworn thing beforehand saying you would not identify uh, any of the people you found at that rally. So, yeah, they, <clears throat> they, they still embraced being invisible. D.C. Stevenson, as you pointed out, said he thought he would have won the presidency in 1928. Do, as somebody who researched this history, do, do you think he had a chance of winning? It's hard to say. Um, you know, he was a very skillful demagogue. I think he would have easily had that sentency because the governor did plan to appoint him. That was 1924. They had an ailing existing senator who, who died shortly thereafter. Had Stevenson not been in jail awaiting his trial, he would have been named to that Senate seat. And that was going to be his springboard. So, I mean, it's hard to say. Um, the Imperial Wizard of the Klan, the guy who was on the cover of Time magazine, when they had 6 million members, he said, we will easily have 20 million members by the end of the decade. So they were on a pretty upward ascent and gaining ground very rapidly. And like I said, 75 members of Congress. So you could project out if nothing had stopped them they would have continued to become powerful, but it's hard to say what ultimately would have happened. Uh, remember the 28 election um, was Herbert Hoover. Uh, yeah. So, so uh, more mainstream, certainly mainstream compared to the Klan Republican who won. So it's hard to say. Uh, Imperial Wizard. Again, you were saying earlier the Imperial Dragon is the leader of, of a region. Is Imperial The Grand Dragon. The Grand, Grand Dragon. Dragon. Is, yeah. And then the Wizard is, is the... the Capo di Capo, yeah, the head guy, right? And just the term "imperial" is is interesting. Well, they, yeah, they they also called their clan headquarters in Atlanta, which was a giant mansion, white columned mansion. They called it the Imperial Palace. So, um, yeah, they embraced that. What happened to the other leaders of the KKK so, when this came? Uh, crashed? Yeah, it's really Did interesting. They come crashing they, down. Yeah. Um, William Simmons, who was the founder of the 1920s Klan, when he and 15 men went up a Stone Mountain, Georgia, 19, and pledged fealty to God and, and the new reborn Klan, um, 
was like Stevenson, a raging alcoholic uh, who also had a uh, fondness for prostitutes. And he was ousted in a coup that Stevenson helped to stage. Um, so they never, Hiram Wesley Evans, the guy on the cover of Time magazine, he was ousted. And the guy who followed him took the Klan into bankruptcy. So none of them, you know, th their peak was 1925. And then 1926, it's over or? It's not over, but it's greatly diminished. And um, it became, there was just a trickle of people denouncing them, but then it became a torrent of people denouncing them. But I will say there's an asterisk, and this is a sad part of my book. Um, in 1930, in the town of Marion, Indiana, they lynched. These who, good Hoosiers lynched two African Americans and tried to lynch a third. They broke the arms of one man after they strung him up with a tree. They dropped him down and broke his arms and strung him up again. And all night, hundreds of people posed in front of these dangling corpses on a summer night in Marion, Indiana, taking what were the 1920s equivalent of selfies. No person was ever brought to justice. And there were tons of pictures of who the mob was. It was the last known lynching of an african-american in the north north of the mason dixie line and that happened you know five years after this trial with the first clan as you mentioned ulysses s grant used the military to put down the clan or law enforcement at least to put down the clan did, did the government ever go after this clan no um many people begged them to go after them but Calvin Coolidge, whose nickname was Silent Cal, lived up to, you know, he just was, he just didn't believe, you know, he only worked 16 hours a week. He was the most minimalist president we ever had. He rarely spoke. Um, there's a famous story about a woman going to a dinner party with Coolidge and, and saying, you know, I just bet my friend I could get you to say three words. And he said, you lose. So, you know, this guy was a non-interventionist, non, he did, didn't do it. never set the, he could have broken them with the federal government and the NAACP asked him to do that because they were also about terror. I mean, there were lynchings going on all over the South. There was, you know, tar and feathering and iron branding. And the worst thing of all was the Tulsa race massacre, 1921, when 300 blacks in a prosperous African-American community in Tulsa, Oklahoma were brutally murdered and no one was brought to justice for that. So no, they, Grant brought the force of the federal government against these bastards. Coolidge never did. It is interesting. This all follows in the 1920s, 1919, when we had what was called Red Summer, in which there were race riots across the country. Yeah. Well, I mean, again, it was we, we'd come out of this is part and parcel of why the 20s were such a churning decade and somewhat similar to the, our 20s. We'd come out of a pandemic. Um where people were locked down for two years and a million Americans died of influenza. Uh, we'd come out of a horrible war, so-called Great War, which was a senseless war that killed 170,000 Americans, but also 200,000 black Americans fought in that war. And when they came home, they wanted to be full citizens and they realized they couldn't be full citizens. So yeah, the stuff that happened in the late teens leading into that decade was part and parcel of a of what we saw and, and what's revealed in my book. And finally, Timothy Egan, wh why why tell this story today? Why why was it important for you to do this now? Well, I, I'll be honest with you. My primary goal is I, I always look for a good story. I, I am a storyteller. Call me a historian, but I, you know, at my core, I'm a storyteller. I come out of the Irish storytelling tradition, and um, so I look for a story. And this has a, this is a classic story of good versus evil. But the deeper I got into it, I just kept having these holy cow moments that, my God, this is so similar. You know, it has a different name right now. No one would call himself a Klansman. But this sort of fear of others, not to mention the racial animus, it just comes and goes in our history. This fear of immigrants, um, it comes and goes in our history. This fear of socially you know, liberated people, whether they're trans today or flappers back then, it comes and goes in our history. So I, flappers. you know, you, yeah, flappers, exactly. And my grandmother was a flapper. Well, she what's a flapper? A, a woman who went out to a speakeasy, drank bootleg gin, uh, wore a 
scandalous outfit, um, stayed out late partying, um, and just defied every one of the moral uh, dictates of the late Victorian age. Um, so, so you know, I went into this story looking looking to tell a tale. I came out of it thinking, my God, this is another example of how history rhymes. Timothy Egan has been our guest. Again, Timothy Egan has joined us for a conversation about his book. It's called A Fever in the Heartland, The Ku Klux Klan's Plot to Take Over America and the Woman Who Stopped Them. And it really was a plot to take over America. It absolutely was. They were open about it. Timothy Egan, thank you for your time. I really enjoyed the interview. Thank you for your time.